Welcome to the I Create Daily Podcast. I'm Leora Alderson. And I'm Devani Alderson. We're your co-hosts on this journey of creativity and productivity. I Create Daily is for artists in every genre of creating, from musicians to writers, crafters to inventors, bloggers to entrepreneurs. I Create Daily is a movement for creators serious about your art. If you're into creating anything, this podcast is definitely for you. Thank you so much for joining us on this journey. Hello and welcome to the I Create Daily podcast, a movement for creators serious about their art. I am Devani Alderson. And I'm Leora. And today we are... You're doing the intro. (laughs) Okay. So if you're in need of a book of book editing services and tips... Today's guest will have some answers and insights for you. Sandra Haven is a professional editor and writer who has helped hundreds of writers achieve their dreams and complete their story projects since 1990. For over two decades, Sandra Haven has provided editorial services as a freelance editor for writers and book publishers from around the world. Sandra's editing career includes serving as a senior editor for Writers International Forum, a magazine helping women women authors worldwide to be more successful in their writing endeavors. Sandra Haven is also a multiple times internationally published author in the areas of short fiction to human interest articles and from mainstream genre, including humor, mystery, romance, satire, and science fiction. And tomorrow, Sandra launches her new Kindle book titled How to Publish a Book, Novel, or Series, Essential Guide to Publishers, Agents, digital and self publishing, and it is the Writer Solution Series Book One. Welcome, Sandra. Thank you very much. I appreciate you allowing me to join you this way. This is grand. And the other part of the intro is that Sandra is editor for my husband, Devani's father, Coleman Alderson, uh, who has published two books so far. And that's a, so how we came to meet Sandra is I, uh, Coleman was com- coming to the nearing the completion of his first book, looking for a book editor. And I saw you on LinkedIn and connected with you on LinkedIn and then connected the two of you. And it has just been, I mean, we got so lucky to find you as our very first effort to find an editor, um, which means that you're doing something right on LinkedIn marketing as well or or optimizing. Um, And Coleman has just been, he has raved about working with you throughout each of both of his books. So that's, uh, that's really, um, it has inspired him. He's been so impressed. Even when he gets back the first round of edits from you you know which have to have of course the most markups it's right. like well there's a lot of red there's a lot of markups but it's all so good and it all makes so much sense and she's so clear and so thorough so thank- yeah go ahead. sorry go ahead oh thank you it's been a joy to, to work with coleman his his writing skills are are uh, exemplary to start with uh, mostly I think it's because he has such a, a clear concept of what he's looking for to get out to the reader and uh, I think that's one of the, the biggest stumbling blocks for writers is they don't have that initial concept really clear in their mind and Coleman had that you know wonderful so, yeah it's just a matter of pulling it all together the right way so that the the reader can grasp the emotions that he's trying to pull through. Right. And we're going to get into so much more of that in in this episode. Um, But first, tell Mm -hmm. us, how did you, okay, let me just actually back up just a second. Normally we ask, how did you get started? And we're getting ready to ask that. But when I said that, (laughs) I remembered seeing a photo on your website, which everyone has to go and look at. It's just so precious. There's Sandra. What, you were about five? (laughs) About four, yeah. About four years old. Four-year-old Sandra, and then the more current, recent Sandra, and you look exactly the same. I mean, it's so precious. It's the same expression, and you can so picture that four-year-old Sandra becoming an editor. But tell us what your journey was, how you became. Well, well, I will start with that photograph since you bring it up. Um, It was... um, I did not remember the photograph until we were digging some through some uh, old family photos and I found it. And um, what Laura didn't fully explain is that I'm actually, as a child, sitting at a typewriter. 
And we're talking the old, you know, plunk typewriter. And uh, everything, obviously, it's an old picture in all all (laughs) respects. But I'm looking, I'm typing at the typewriter, and I look up, because obviously, dad took my picture. This was, this was his, his gig. He loved writing. Mm -hmm. And so I know I got that from him. And so I'm certain he was the one that also took that, uh, that photograph of me then. So when I did find that, I thought, well, how perfect to have me again, but this time at a computer looking the same way. So it was, <laughs> it was great. Yeah, <laughs> oh, it was perfect. It's so great. I'm so good that you included that. So, <laughs> how, so how did you go from there? Obviously, fast forward to adulthood or when it ever was that you, so I, I imagine you grew up with an interest in writing. And then how did all of that morph into becoming an editor? Yeah, there was, there was, I guess, uh, no question from the beginning in school that, that words and writing, anything to do with the language was really important to me, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, so um, I, it was pretty easy for me to, to become basically a technical writer to start with, mm-hmm. and that's where, where I worked. That's where my career was for quite a few years. Uh, I worked for a government contractor. U.S. government contractor that um, had lots of technical manuals. Some of the um, contracts that we had were strictly to write technical manuals, and others uh, needed manuals to be written for the work that they were having done. So that's where I started, and uh, in fairly short order, I ended up being one of their technical editors and working on their government proposals. Um, That doesn't sound very exciting, and in lots of respects, it's not. Um, however, it was a tremendous uh, learning experience for me. Um, the requirements involved are very specific in what is needed for a, either a technical uh, document or to fulfill a proposal. And so um, I went from there to writing uh, articles for various magazines, special interest magazines in particular, and from there into fiction. So it was a natural progression as far as writing is concerned. Um, How I got into editing is a a little bit different story. Um, I found that uh, I enjoyed writing very much. Obviously, I was doing it both in my career and uh, on my spare time, too. And I joined uh, some writers groups and uh, really enjoyed the interaction. I loved hearing the, the uh, chapters of the other group members and then having a chance to discuss them and kind of take them apart and consider what their, their approach was and how it would react to their audience. So then um, I realized that uh, if I didn't attend some of the meetings that I couldn't go to for one reason or another, that I would get a phone call afterwards asking these, these different group members, asking me if I would on the side go ahead and look at their chapters. Mm-hmm. Then it turned out that some of the meetings, they would call to see if I was going to attend before they held it. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, so were you <laughs> editing... Were you editing in those movies, uh, meetings, sorry, um, no, like you were I, providing editing or? I wasn't, I didn't think of it as that at the time. And then I realized that's exactly what it was. Mm. And that's what they were looking for. So um, my husband was already involved with publishing. He'd worked for newspapers and uh, he had done, and I helped him of course with uh, some um, special interest magazines that he was publishing, all industry type things. So he said, you know, we've already are doing magazines. Let's do one for writers and give them a place where they can put their short stories and their essays and then have other writers write in and the following month put in little critiques, suggestions, comments. Mm-hmm. It was kind of a, a, a precursor to the internet where yeah. you post something online and then you get comments back from yeah. it. Yeah. So um, we did that. We started, we originally called it uh, Writers Open Forum, but um, we soon had kind of an international audience. So we had people from around the world, which is a real thrill. And so we made it international, Writers International Forum. 
And we did uh, achieve quite a few accolades from Writers uh, Digest and such for uh, encouraging new writers. And uh, we were really pleased to get the ranking that we did in their, their polls. Um, but again, it turned out that some of the writers that would send things in to the magazine would say, I don't really want this published, but could you just tell me what you think of it? Okay. Mm. Mm. And some of them would write in and say, if I pay you something, could you just edit it for me? So my husband, who's maybe the smarter of us, uh, said, you know, what you really should be doing <laughs> is editing instead of publishing. So um, with his encouragement, um, we turned our uh, rather large database of subscribers for the magazine, explained what we were changing over, gave them the opportunity if they were interested in, in uh, working with me at, to do some editing. And I ended up with a, a nice um, clientele base right from the, the get-go at that point. And from then, it's just, it's just uh, skyrocketed in a respect. Uh, I can only take on so many clients, so uh, there are limitations there. But that's how it all began. Fantastic. A wonderful story. Yeah, and I do see uh, your natural you know, talent, you know, seeing, it's almost like the puzzle. You see the big picture, you know, of someone's book in a way, and you're able to kind of move it around as puzzle pieces, as I've observed you do with Coleman. It sounds like you're able to, you have to also, when you were like in the writer's meetings, hearing audibly their description of their story, you have to be able to make that connection, the audible connection, as well as the reading of the written word and kind of see it, you know, like a bigger picture as an editor. Now, there are so many um, kinds of editors um, and, you know, your specialty is book editing. Um, and do you have a preference for fiction? Uh, is that predominantly what you do? Right. Um, that's something that I learned early on also. And I think that's something important for writers to understand is that uh, each one of us has a special niche. And we really need to understand that and to uh, kind of honor it. And, and it will pay off for you uh, because you can grow in that area so much easier than you could if you tried to force yourself to to write or do something that really isn't in your nature if you know what i mean um so yes i found that editing was a natural for me and in fact i preferred it to actually to writing and um Interesting. that is, is something that i finally realized and and then as far as finding the right uh, field the more I edited of one type of, of fiction, the more I enjoyed uh, working with those authors. And for me, uh, right now, I, I work with science fiction, fantasy, and uh, mystery writers. Uh, uh, sometimes I do memoirs also, but that's where I focus. And uh, it, it works best because that's where my passion is. Yes. That's what I enjoy. And uh, that gives me the, the ability to just feel enthused, not just about helping the writer, but about the story itself. Yeah. Uh, I think that's an important factor when you're doing anything creative. And I know you're, you're podcasters for all kinds of creative people. And that's uh, probably, I think, one of the biggest keys is just to stay true to your own passion when you, mm -hmm. when you do whatever it is you do. Yeah, that's that makes so much sense. And we want to get a little bit more in a little bit later to into the specific tips that you have for writers as well as aspiring editors uh, or exi exi existing editors. Um, but first, I was wondering, like, sort of like the curiosity of imagining if someone is um, into film productions, you know, do they, it's hard for them to go to the movie and see the movie like the rest of us. So for you, if you just wanted, to, I mean, do you actually sit down and read for recreational now, you know, and if so can you do that without also being an editor? Like, how does that work for you? Um, yes, that is actually sometimes difficult. Um, first of all, if I'm going to work with an author that uh, wants to emulate a certain type of known author, 
and uh, to fit a certain niche. Um, I will gather up books in that area and basically speed read through them to get the full flavor and impact that that particular author is trying to work towards. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that, that goes kind of back to my technical background because um, I'm trying to fill a need for that particular author for what they want for their voice and for, for their style. Yeah. Uh, I still want to always keep their specific voice unique, but if they particularly want to write like Frank, Frank Patterson or someone, uh, then I need to, to have a feel for that as well. When I do that reading, it's, I would not call that for pleasure. That's uh, picking it apart for, for the people. <laughs> Yeah. Um, when I read for pleasure, the only time I really read for pleasure is on vacation or at night when I'm going to bed. Yeah. And um, I have a, just a very few authors that um, I really like. And uh, I will read and reread those books sometimes. Um, and uh, then I also like a really uh, eclectic um, grouping of nonfiction books. I like to read about uh, science projects and uh, astronomical observations that have come up recently. Um, those things are just stimulating to me. So I guess for my pleasure reading, it, it's that. Although uh, obviously some of those details can then help when I'm working with a Absolutely. science fiction author too. Yeah, so definitely. How do you when you're you're reading things for? somebody for research um, or helping somebody else emulate. You're reading all your clients' work for helping them in their editing. And then you're also reading on your own when just for enjoyment. How do you, what is your process for keeping all of that organized? Because it, it almost sounds like, you know, you're reading all this stuff and it almost sounds like it could be like, all these voices in your head going on, like you have ideas for this person or you have edits for this person. How do you keep all of that straight? Uh, do you want, you want to get a little more complicated? <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. sure. Um, I have a variety of clients who are actually working with, I have a, a special program I call Write As We Go. And they will send me two, three, four, five chapters. Um, I'll work on those chapters and send them back. At that point, they can take my ideas that I have mentioned or the concerns that I have, and they may want to make tweaking changes to the next four or five chapters before they send them to me. So this means that there's a real time frame going on. Uh, mm -hmm. There's uh, quite a gap of time between when I'm working on a few chapters before I get the next batch and the next batch. So in the meantime, I have other writers who are also sending me batches of chapters. Wow. <laughs> so, yes, so I have quite a few um, ongoing clients uh, that I work with all the time that um, uh, use this process. Um, and also, of course, if someone has a complete manuscript, I'll work on that all at one in one chunk. But uh, I'm not too sure how to answer how I keep it straight. I really don't. Um, it takes me just a few minutes of thinking of the names of the new, not new, but the, the existing characters in someone's book. And honestly, I tend to think of the characters' names before I think of the author's names sometime. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. But I think of those characters and I just pull up that story um, in my heart more than in my mind, the, mm. the, the feelings that I had about their struggles or um, what they were seeking or looking for. And um, I use that and I just plunge right back into the story again. Mm. I do keep, I, you know, to, to be honest, I keep a, a, a complete listing of all of the characters' names, uh, their relationship, <laughs> that kind of thing. Um, but most of the time I don't refer too much to them. Uh, I don't know. It's just, just the way I work. 
Well, and uh, I mean, our observation of you and also certainly in um, communications we've had before the podcast, as well as, you know, uh, tracking your journey, Coleman's journey with you, is that you just have a very innate sense of order. You know, you're very organized and, yeah. and I would say sis, probably systematized. But and so I'm going to ask you in a few minutes about the software, for instance, what kind of writing softwares. But for now, like the theme that I'm hearing is a part of your life theme, which seems to be empathy Would that does that resonate as far as like one of your stronger traits? Oh yes. Um, I'm, most of my clients become all the same as dear friends. I know them. I talk to them on the phone. Uh, we correspond. We keep up with each other on our progress on different things. Um, and many of these have gone on. They're, they're doing their own thing now. Uh, mm -hmm. If I can, if I can help a writer, to become strong on their own and understand the structure that they need and be able to go off and do their next book without help, I feel totally accomplished. You know, yeah. I, mean, yeah. I don't want to turn down business, right? right? But at the same time, my whole idea is to help them as writers. And there's yeah. no better help than, than knowing that they've been able to achieve that. That's right. So you, you know, you, Go ahead. Sorry. I, I feel empathy for, for the writers and I, I feel empathy for my characters too. Oh, that, right. Yeah. I mean, that was a, so it's like a, you're hearing, you know, there's that listening, there's that tuning in and that's what empathy is really tuning into someone else. You're tuning into what they're trying to achieve. You're tuning into the plight of the characters as well as the plight of the author. And it seems like you shuffle your innate organizational skills tends to um, syn synchronize, you know, in a way, all of yeah. that. Uh, yeah, I am inordinately organized. Uh, <laughs> I, have, uh, I have structures all over the place, and I'm a total note keeper. Um, and uh, so that helps. To, and that, you know, that goes back to my technical training. Uh, you have to have that. Um, so that's, that's a, a good trait. Uh, and I know that a lot of writers kind of work, go right from the seat of their pants type of a right. thing. <laughs> right. And... <laughs> Um, they, they don't have that kind of uh, planning ahead or structure. And that's where they come into the most uh, trouble later on, midway through the book. Uh, suddenly it's just like, uh, wait a minute, where am I going with this? Midway through the paragraph. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or, or even paragraph, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but that's, yeah. that's my thing is to, to see where the structure really is the the uh, real skeleton of the story and make sure all the bones are in place <laughs> yeah Definitely. what are the biggest um i guess what are the biggest tips you see based on the most common mistakes you see with um especially fiction writers since that's your main um area well probably the biggest one is not uh fully understanding their audience um <clears throat> the majority of writers um, tend to think they have this wonderful story and everyone's going to love it. Right. That's really not true. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm sure that there are books that, that you two have read that Coleman is just really not interested in. Okay. And I'm sure there's ones that Coleman's read that you couldn't care less about. Absolutely. Uh, it, it's just a fact that we all have our own uh, particular field that we like. Um, the old, uh, uh, an approach in reading that we enjoy. And I think writers need to start by understanding their specific audience and what that audience uh, appreciates the most. Um, <clears throat> they do, d there's a variety of ways to do that, of course. Um, one is knowing what your story is similar to in, and we're getting into genre, and subgenre, yeah. um, because um, not all fantasies are the same. Uh, I think there's, even in Wikipedia, there's something like 24, 28 different subgenres of fantasy that you yeah. can about. And uh, for instance, those who like to read urban fantasies are not going to appreciate medieval fantasies. Different, to totally different audience. So if you know who your audience is and you've read uh, the best of that subgenre, 
you'll get the feel of the types of things that the audience really wants. Um, if it turns out that you as a writer really don't want to write that, maybe you need a slightly different subgenre to get into. Mm. So, so knowing the audience, I think, is, is the biggest thing. Um, and for myself, um, it was interesting that uh, you mentioned that you found me through LinkedIn because that's where the majority of my audience comes from, my clientele. Mm. Mm. And um, for all of the uh, interest that there is in other social media, uh, for me, LinkedIn is, is the best for my specific types of people who come to me for help. And I think that's the other thing is, is another tip. Uh, writers shouldn't try to fracture themselves across all the social media and think that's necessarily the way to do it. Right. Yes. No, I agree with that. Yeah, completely. that makes a lot of sense. So you are, you recently written your, your book um, and let me just say that title again, the how to publish a book novel or series, Essential Guide to Publishers, Agents, Digital, and Self-Publishing, Writer Solution Series, Book One. So what do you have planned uh, beyond that? And, who, and how, how is the editing process for you as yeah, well? Yeah. Oh, editing myself? Yes. Oh, that was interesting. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, fortunately, um, because my husband's been involved with publishing too, um, he was able to um, be my first line editor for me, uh, which didn't cause a divorce. So that's, you know, that's a good <laughs> sign. Um, and I did have some uh, very good uh, writing friends who were uh, able to function as beta readers for me. So awesome. that helped. Um, one in particular uh, really changed uh, my concept of how extensive the book needed to be um, because the book originally was going to be much shorter and um, as she wisely uh, explained you need to give them uh, more of the meat right off the bat because there's so much involved in getting published mm -hmm. uh, so the the book really is um, as it says how to uh, to publish a, a book novel or series it covers a book that you might go through a traditional publisher if you're looking for an agent and one of the big five commercials, uh, or if you're looking for small press, or if you're even given any thought to self-publishing. Uh, I've just described the various methods that you can use. Um, I think the important thing is that you, every writer needs to not only find their own niche audience, but they need to find the best approach for publishing their book. And for some, it's going to be going through an agent. For some, it's going to be self-publishing. And, and for some, it's going to be an assisted self-publishing. And if they understand all these different methods, then they can make a smart decision that, that will suit what, what they want. Right. As far as what I'm going to do next, um, I do actually have a couple more books that are actually... Um, 90% written about uh, the writing process itself. So I'll be nice. uh, delivering those next. Fantastic. So we, and we're going to talk with you about, so, so after this session, um, right now, this is the interview with Sandra Haven folks. And after this, and we're going to do a mastermind with Sandra to help her identify how she can develop further develop her website and her blog to attract more traffic organically to her website um, and so along those lines Sandra one of the things we'll be talking about as well is your book and the other books that might come about as a as a part of that right um, and, and some title ideas so that'll include your book as well as for some articles it it really could be like a almost like a five-part series but yeah, we're gonna right. we're gonna touch on a few things on each of those possibilities to start. So okay. for folks that want to join us, that'll be on the I Create Daily Coffee Break. No, actually, it's not Mastermind coffee. Sorry, session. Mastermind Session. So, um, and it'll probably air um, a like week a, later yeah, a week later or a few days after this one. So just keep okay. an eye out for that. If you're listening to Sandra's session now, then look for the Mastermind Session for 
Um, or what did we say? Did we say we were going to title it yet? We haven't. Um, okay, yet. so <laughs> optimizing for book editors. Anyway, for now, so look for the Sandra next Sandra Haven episode. If we could, though, get back to um, I mentioned asked about your what tools you use uh, as a as, as an editor. Like, what kind of tools do you use to edit? I mean, there's so many questions. I'm just gonna well, let's, I, I, I I don't know if I should throw them all at you or let you just give you one at a time. So we'll start there, one at a time. Um, okay. What's your first? <laughs> so, so the first one is what tools do you use as an editor? Well, I wouldn't, um, as an editor. Um, like, for instance, in... Um, tool overall is, um, for writing, is Scrivener. Okay. And uh, it is... Yeah, it's a tremendous organizational tool. Uh, you can use it, and I do use it, to uh, organize all of my research for different things that I'm working on. Um, and uh, then from the research stage, you can take those same uh, nuggets and turn them into chapters, scenes, whatever you need. So Scrivener uh, is, is my, my best tool. Um, I will say, though, there is a tremendous learning curve on it. Uh, it's not an easy program. So uh, you can get the basics to start with pretty easily, but it can get pretty complex rather quickly if you start to use it to, uh, for instance, then um, use what they call compile and compile what you have in that file into a PDF, a Word document, uh, iMobi, uh, EPUB, uh, that's the other advantage of Scrivener is you can, in fact, turn all that material into um, basically publishing ready a file. Um, but you have to learn how to do that. So, right. you know, I, I'm not going to be dishonest about uh, explaining that. Um, my word processor that I use is Microsoft Word. Um, the reason basically is because 95% of my clients do. Uh, and um, I have a few that use open office um, and pages. Uh, I can use any of those, but word is the one most people use. Um, what else? Uh, Evernote is great for keeping track of just on the spur of the moment ideas that come. I've got it on my phone so that I can, I can make use of that. Uh, and I think, I think that's about it really. So you use, when you send Coleman his um, edited documents, so to your writers, it comes in as a word document, right? Correct. And yet mm -hmm. he's in Scrivener and you're in Scrivener. So does Scrivener not have within it the editing option? No. Okay. It doesn't have, it doesn't have tracking. Okay. And that, so I use Word because it has the ability to, I can actually uh, strike out a line, uh, add a word, uh, put a comment on the side, that kind of thing. And right. Scripture doesn't yeah. have that. Right. So explain to us, please, the different kinds of editors that a book, uh, that an author is going to need to, to hire or find. That's probably one of the, the first things that uh, confuse people. Uh, and I have a lot of uh, people who've come to me and said, oh, you know, I can always find that misplaced comma in a book. I should be an editor. And that's fine, but they don't realize that's a copy editor. That's the person uh, at the end of the line. Um, because let's be honest, if, if a chapter isn't really needed in a book, right. The whole chapter is going to go, not just the comma. You know? Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so there's a whole lot. And so that's the, the first line editor you need. Well, actually, you can have something before that. And that's beta readers. If you want to uh, take advantage of uh, friends and family and fellow writers uh, who would like, like to read your book and uh, see what they think of it, uh, you can go through that process first. Uh, the problem with that is you have to realize that, first of all, again, not everybody likes every book, okay? Right. So you really only want to employ beta readers who know your genre and appreciate it. And um, then the second thing is some people, their idea of a critique is say, 
that was good. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, or, especially if they don't want to offend you or if they don't know what lines they're crossing by saying something or whatever. Right. right. And then there's those who don't mind crossing it and just say, uh, didn't care for it. Yeah. And that's it. You know, so you haven't gained anything. So um, beta readers, although most writers tend to use them, there's a lot of pitfalls in, in using them, too. So what you really need is a developmental editor, which is what I do. Uh, that's also uh, has call, been called a content editor, um, uh, sub substantive editor, basically looking at the entire package of the story and how it structurally uh, fits. Uh, if, I, if I might tell a, a slight personal story on Coleman. Yeah. Yes, totally. absolutely. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> in, his, uh, in his one book, he had, um, I think it was two chapters that were basically one big scene of Rosie. And uh, I loved it. It was great. Very interesting about the experiences of this woman. And I won't, I won't spoil anything. Um, the only trouble was it didn't fit in that book. Mm -hmm. it, it, it was a story in itself mm -hmm. and it deserved to be a story in itself, mm -hmm. but it didn't belong in that book. And so after I read through that and the, the rest of the, the, those chapters and I'm going, Oh, okay. So I, I took a breather, took, took the night off, so to speak. <laughs> and the next day explained to him that this this is a fascinating story. In fact, it would really appeal even to a, a broader audience in a respect. Um, but it just didn't belong there. Okay. And that's what a developmental adult, I can't say it, developmental yeah. editor will do yeah. is um, try to find what fits and what doesn't fit, mm. uh, what makes that specific story as strong as possible. Um, and, you know, it gets involved with uh, continuity, making sure if it's a mystery, making sure all of the, the hints are in the right place so they can be revealed later. Um, and if there, it's, it's science fiction, uh, that the various uh, aspects, the uh, factual, uh, make some kind of sense. They don't have to always be uh, totally true to life, uh, but they have to make enough sense that they don't trip the reader up. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's a developmental editor. And then from there, um, you can go directly to a copy editor once you're satisfied with the story itself. And, um, and then the copy also, editor, and the, excuse me, the copy editor primarily does what? Um, does the grammar, uh, okay. spelling, um, punctuation, um, some continuity, that kind of thing. Uh, just making sure that the language itself uh, is correct and uh, presentable. Okay, and then what is there? Is there one after that? Well, there are. There's also line editors. Um, probably the line editor would come before the copy editor, but not everyone uses both. Uh, a line editor is looking uh, literally at at whole sentences to make sure that they flow properly. But then the, the copy editor gets into the, to the nitty gritty. Most times um, writers will find an editor who can do both, but you know, it's, it's up to you and also up to, to how strong your language skills are. Yeah, sure. Yeah. That makes sense. And you know, the, that the copy editor would find most of the things that a line mi editor might. Um, and that a lot of these de delineations probably um, arose out of the publishing industry where it was nothing to have, you know, six editors for every book kind yeah. of thing. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Uh, and sadly, um, most traditional publishers are shortchanging some of that process. So that's why you'll find that there uh, is more of a demand on the writer to present a cleaner manuscript uh, to a publisher from the, the very beginning now. Right, right. In which case, uh, so... so Authors, even those who are not intending to be self-published, which is such a viable option these days, uh, because pretty much the publishers are only going to be going to be interested in you if you already have a platform. 
Um, and if you already have a platform, then you really don't need them. It's up to you. Whatever, you know, like many of the people in the professions uh, would prefer that, or if they have a, a vision. There's still of, a prestige. A prestige factor. being published. You know, if they have a plan to, you know, develop an entire platform and they have the resources to do that, then, then that works. But otherwise, so many people when they're, what I was going to finish saying is that, even those who are going to go in with a publisher or seek a publisher would benefit by having uh, an editor first. So a content development editor first, right? It's not, uh, not only a good idea, it's pretty much essential. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, traditional publishers are so swamped uh, with submissions that they don't have the time or the interest in yeah. uh, developing your story for you. Uh, it needs to be already ready for them. Right. And, uh, it's uh, and yeah, then you have this this double edged uh, idea. Well, if you've gotten it that far, and if self publishing is so so easy, so to speak, uh, why why not do that? Um, there's advantages both ways, and that's yeah. what I try to explain in the book. And uh, you know, if you can find a traditional publisher, an agent who will work with you, uh, that's grand. Um, they have the, the marketing machine behind them to really get your book out. Um, but on the other hand, uh, if you have a following already and you have an audience that you can tap into, your actual percentage of profit is much higher as a self-publisher. Right. Yeah. right. So, you know, you have to just make your own decision. And the publishing companies these days will only put the marketing behind those authors who are already well known. They require the smaller authors to do their own marketing. What you then have with the publishers is the distribution. So you yeah. have distribution, you get into their catalog, you get into the bookstores that are left uh, besides Amazon. Um, yeah. And so, so the bottom line is, and, and many authors may not know this, you know, when they're searching, they just search editor. I need a book editor, you know, book editing services. Yeah. Um, and so really their first line would be to come to you and that's for a developmental book editor, right? Right, right. Okay, good, awesome. good. So, so that's good. We, we have people in our audience who are obviously authors as well as editors or aspiring editors. And we've already, we're kind of short on time already. So I don't want to get into that in too big a way, but we would like to just ask a couple quick questions. And that is, so, cause I think you've already covered some of the mistakes that edit, that authors and writers make. So we've touched on that. Um, and as an editor, if somebody is aspiring to become a, a professional editor, uh, either freelance or with their own company, do you have any tips or advice for them? Um, I think the biggest problem that I have seen with uh, other editors is that they don't always honor the, the voice and the style of the authors that come to them. Uh, I've had quite a few clients come to me uh, who have been kind of shell-shocked by uh, other editors who I uh, want to turn their book into something that the author never really intended in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't mean that they want to change the story so much, although sometimes that's the case, but they wanted to, to change the whole, um, the whole tone. And um, I think that's what editors need to be most aware of is that they, they need to honor that. Uh, that's, that's why the writer is writing. It's their voice and their ideas in their own way that they want to get out. And the, the editor's job is just, just to help them make that stronger, not to change it. Right. Yes, definitely. Do you have any, so being an editor, you know, it's still from the standpoint of I create daily, you're still creating. You are helping people develop and create their, you know, their words in an organized fashion. And you're bringing your own creativity to that, kind of like with a mastermind vision perspective, mm -hmm. relative to your own schedule of editing and all of that, as well as your own writing. Do you have a daily schedule as systemized, systemized and organized as you are? Do you have a daily creative schedule? Uh, I do, although I, I have found that I um, need to be flexible also. Um, I start with emails instantly, and from those emails, I don't answer them. I make a list of who has corresponded with me, 
what it's going to entail to get back to them. And if it's something fast, I just do it right then. Um, but most of the time, I tend to think things through a little bit and plan out what I'm going to say to the people or how I need to approach them. So that starts my day as far as I know these are the things that have come in uh, that I need to address. Um, I also then have right next to me the list that I made before I went to bed that told me the uh, uh, particular things I need to accomplish that day. Uh, so um, that's where I start. Um, I then devote a couple of hours in the afternoon for my own writing and organizing my own research material. Uh, otherwise, I would never get my other, my <laughs> other writing done. Yeah. Um, and I think that's pretty much it. I mean, the rest, uh, because of uh, personal schedules, uh, situations with family and such, I need to, to always keep some flexibility involved. And uh, not always easy for someone who likes to be organized. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a really good tip on the on what you do with the email and prioritizing what needs responding to. Because I know a couple of people in our group over the past couple of weeks have been talking about just how to prioritize responding to other people, whether it's social media or email. And you know, when you're building an audience as an author, that's its own job role. And responding to emails. Uh, whether you're an editor or any kind of creative, it's sort of like once you see it, you almost feel obligated to respond and you're thinking like, I, I come from a service business background as well. And so in the back of your mind, you're like, they know, they know that I'm ignoring this and haven't responded to this. And so you're like itching to say what you need <laughs> to say to them. Right. But I think that's a really good tip. I'm going to start using that as well to just prioritize what needs responding to and how it needs by how it needs a response right and that gives you the time to do it uh and give them the best service too because yeah, right. you have given uh them the time slot that they need um you know to to get the right answer right yeah so are there any areas of your business in your work that you struggle with oh uh time yeah. time um uh, again, we, you know, we have, uh, everyone does, we all have uh, life issues that uh, get involved. And I know internet cables get cut. Yeah. You know? yeah. Uh, all sorts of things uh, happen when you're, you're, you've made plans and you specifically need to get a bid off or you need to have a video conference or something and uh, suddenly you're pulled away to a doctor's appointment or you're pulled away to uh, some other issue that you have to take care of. Uh, and it's, it's been a challenge um, to relax enough to say, you know what, you know, I'm just going to reschedule, going to yeah. think this through, uh, it'll work out better later. Yeah. And uh, it does, but, uh, but it's still a, a struggle. <laughs> to be flexible with fl with the with the flow of life, which is yes. not always organized. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah. That's right. I understand. Well, speaking of which, so what Sandra's uh, innuendo is that uh, we were going to first do this record this video interview last week, and uh, a cable was cut, and her Wi-Fi, her internet rather, went down. And but tell us briefly because we forgot to ask you early up, uh, up front, and that is, you live on a beautiful island in Washington, right? No, live on the Olympic Peninsula. It's not okay. quite an island. Not quite okay. an island. Okay. But the Olympic Peninsula, it's a, a gorgeous uh, evergreen state, and we're uh, probably the most evergreen portion of the state. Wow. Um, we're very happy and, and surrounded by lots of water around us, so yeah. uh, we enjoy our marinas and such as often as we can. It's a great writer's area, too, a great area for, you know, kind of like the romance and nuance. I would imagine there are some writer's retreats around there as well, bed and breakfast or what have you. Yes, and a lot of science fiction uh, writers here. Um, uh, Frank Herbert came from this area. And awesome. um, so, yeah, we, it's a stimulating area for creativity. Yeah, nice. Well, I can imagine the great, like, dystopic and science fiction that comes out of just being surrounded by nature that's, like, 
eerie and cool and kind of spooky, but amazing. <laughs> There's a lot that can happen there. Well, look at the Twilight Saga. Yeah, exactly. Twilight is from the Olympic Peninsula. Yeah, That's true. Yeah, that yes. definitely came to mind for sure. Mm-hmm. Well, now you're working a little bit with sh- shifting your or, or going to the next phase of your business because your book is coming out. Um, you also mentioned the concept of time. And of course, it's un- not unlimited for any of us. You're growing and uh, developing your website. You've written a new book. You're creating a series. Where do you, what, is, what are your goals and dreams uh, over the next number of years for yourself and your business? Uh, I have a, a, a great um, grouping of um, authors that I like working with, uh, which I'd like to continue to always do. Um, I'm not uh, adverse to finding new uh, writers also. Uh, But my real focus will be trying to write uh, guides that will help uh, writers in all stages of the writing process. Uh, I think that way I can share more of what I've learned with a greater number of people. And also it will be uh, a nice little um, side uh, business, so to speak, for me. Uh, so that I can, uh, again, just enjoy the the clients that I have and not be marketing for uh, new clients so much as um, just sharing my words with uh, the readers that will be getting in my books. So if you never had to do any work monetarily and you were basically retired early, um, you're, I think you're a baby boomer, like Coleman and I are. And so you still have, you know, plenty of years ahead, but at the same time, you're looking at horizons of where you want it to go. And so let's say that you were at that place already where you were ready, you could choose to retire or continue, choose to never retire. What would you be doing with your time? Oh, well, um, I was privileged to have a studio for a brief period of time well, not brief, actually, it was quite a few years, where I was able to try a, a, a wide variety of art projects. And I enjoyed that very much. But there are a few art projects I'd still like to uh, explore. And so if I had the time, I, I would continue to uh, work as an editor. And in that case, I guess I wouldn't use the word work, but enjoy editing. There you um, go those specific clients that I've already uh, developed a relationship with. Um, But aside from that, I would be doing uh, some very large uh, acrylic paintings Mm. that uh, I have no idea um, what I would ever do with. Um, I've got uh, that in my mind. uh, And I've got a variety of other artistic things that I would like to just just be totally free to just play with. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That sounds like fun. So and fun. and I asked the question partly because I, I did imagine it would be hard to imagine you not always doing some kind of editing um, because, <laughs> you know, again, back to that four-year-old, you know, so you're either writing or editing, you're working with words, you know, and you do it so well. That's well, right. be- before we let you go for this segment, is there anything else you'd like to share with our audience from your experience? Uh, I had written a couple of things down, but I think, you know, I think we pretty much covered it. Um, The thing most important is um, both writers and editors uh, need to stay true to what they like themselves uh, because that, uh, that passion is going to show in their work, uh, whether it's the words they put down or the way they help uh, writers in in editing Um, and find your specific audience. Don't try to fracture yourself into every social media, uh, every group, uh, just find the the area that you really resonate with and go for that. Um, Remember that um, there are expectations being put on whatever you write uh, and um, you you need to honor that as a writer if you want to write for a specific audience and make sure you have, have given them uh, what they're seeking in the in the first place, um, and uh, don't worry about trying to find your writer's voice um, because it's right there. 
Yeah, nice. <laughs> you couldn't get away from it if you wanted to. <laughs> no, that's a great point. You know, I hear you know, that's such a good point. Maybe you could say a little bit more about that because you do hear. Um, we have heard authors in our own group talk about trying to find their voice. They're trying to find, you know, who they are as a writer in a way. Um, and and so what else can you say about that from your observation? Um, I think I think if you write with abandon um, and uh, journaling is one way that, that a lot of writers do that. Uh, it, journaling is not for me. Uh, it isn't for everyone. Um, but I think that is one of the methods um, that you can use to just explore the way you like to put words together. And um, it can be fun, too. Um, I tend to, when I'm going to start something, I just start, I just start writing. There's no punctuation. There's, there's just nothing. And after a few minutes, pretty soon, well, there is punctuation, and the sentences are starting to come together. But that's the, the beginning of the tone for that particular, if it's an article that I'm writing. And uh, then I just, I go with that flow. And um, I, think, I think that's the biggest thing is writers uh, worry that they have writer's block. And I think it's just a fear of not sounding right. And it, it doesn't matter if you just start throwing the words out there, they will come together for you. Um, but you just need to be free about it. That's how do you, sorry, no, go um, ahead. how do you identify sort of when you, when, as I imagine as you work more with a specific author and their story, you start identifying where they stray or um, when something they've written doesn't sound as cohesive as everything else they've written. Are there any... If, intuition on your end as an editor and just because you know what they're writing as well or are there any tips to sort of develop an awareness around just when you sound off versus when it sounds cohesive I guess I don't think I can't think of a tip that I can give but I, I can give an example um, if uh, if Coleman were to start telling you something okay and it doesn't sound quite right, you know he, he's either hiding something um, or he isn't too sure himself. You just know there's something not quite right now. No. How, would you, you know, how do you define that? You're just familiar with him. You just know yeah. what he normally sounds like yes. and something is just not quite right. right. So it's just a familiarity, I think. Yeah. And I think uh, to that point and to the theme of our entire podcast and brand, um, I create daily. And that is that it is through the writing that you discover your voice and what it is, you know, that that, that voice that's there all along begins to find a way to express itself yeah. increasingly more in its own tone. Right, right. So this is it's fantastic. Like a difference between being and trying to be. Yeah. You know, there's yeah. like a difference when you're yeah. just, when you're trying hard, you know, you know when you're trying hard and you know when others are trying hard and it comes across in yeah. creativity too. Yeah. Right. yeah. It's like, oh, that's such a good one because it's like, um, we've talked about this uh, analogy a lot when it is that like if you suddenly were in, a, in an auditorium and needed to walk across the stage, you suddenly forget like how yeah. you even have to walk. <laughs> You know, it's like, it's yeah. like it's something that you never think about normally until you're in a situation. So that's what's happening yeah. when writers are writing or people are talking or whatever it is for the first time speaking in front of an audience, we freeze up back to your earlier point is that, you know, we forget to be ourselves and just let it flow. We're trying right. to overdo it, trying to over impress and trying to overthink. And you probably see this a lot with writers, especially new ones. And that is to overwrite, you know, with yeah. all the different vernacular that we can think of. <laughs> I'm right. so guilty of that too. Yeah. Yeah. Fancy words are not, not what's, what matters. It's, <laughs> it's words that uh, hit home, home <clears throat> for the reader. That's a good quotable. Yeah. I'll definitely quote that. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Sandra. It's been wonderful catching up with you in person on this podcast. And we really look forward to sharing you with our audience and part two, um, our mastermind with you to, to follow. Oh, great. Thank you so much for letting me join you. You're welcome. Definitely. 
Thanks so much for joining us for the I Create Daily podcast. Please let us know what creatives you would like us to interview and what topics you would be interested in hearing more about. And if you enjoyed this show, please leave a review on iTunes. We value your feedback. We read all the reviews and it just helps us get the word out on the I Create Daily podcast. Thank you so much. Thanks so much.